This happened last Sunday and I'm still as mad as a cow with its foot stuck in the mud. Me and my older brother, we'll call Lance, were taking our younger siblings to church on Sunday, and we decided to take the longer way to enjoy some more time of music in my mama's car with ridiculously good speakers. Anyway, I was already not in the most churchy mood that morning cause I wanted to drive my truck but I digress. So we were going down the road just cruising when we came up to a car going around 60 in a 65. No biggie, Lance started to go around. Keep in mind this is an extremely desolate road, and we had not seen any other cats but this one so far. We were about a two suburbans length back from the car when Lance started to pass. As soon as we got right beside the car it swerved almost right into us. This lunatic was trying to run us off the road, so naturally Lance floored it to get past. When we did pass the car sped up right behind our bumper riding our tail so darn close and you could see their jaws jacking away in their car screaming. We were so confused, and had no clue why they swerved. And I remember after laughing and saying, it would be ironic if they went to church, I just couldn't keep my thoughts to myself. The car followed us all the way to town. The town that I ain't gonna disclose is very small. We have a donut shop, parts store, 7 to 11, and a burger place. Well Lance took a sharp turn to go through town to see if they'd follow and sure enough, follow us right into 7-Elevens. As soon as they pulled up next to us we realized it's one of the women that sat in front of us in church. She pulls up and screams, oh it's you. And either me or Lance says, what are you doing trying to run us into the ditch? Then she went off screaming, mf this mf that. Then she screamed, there are kids in the car. What the heck were you thinking? You really want to run us off the road. And I can't believe with her knowing us and being a Christian woman screams, I will run this whole mf in the ditch. That's when I went off. You ain't gonna threaten my little brothers and sisters like that. I don't care who you are. I started screaming back at her that I don't even remember the things I said. But not once in the whole screaming match did I cuss at that woman and she was throwing out F this and EFF that to the world. Then I unbuckled my seatbelt cause she kept acting like she's gonna get out. So now it is probably the time to say that I'm a 17 year old 5 feet 7 inches girl and I ain't small. And if this woman wants to be tough stuff then I show her something to be tough about. We didn't end up getting out cause no matter how much she screamed, get yo daddy, I take him down too. Which you okay lady, have your tantrum. The last thing I remember screaming at her was, you're a pathetic excuse for an adult. That's when she got mad and floored it. She was at the entrance of the 7-Eleven still screaming, get yo daddy. Ugh, naive women. Lance just kept saying very calmly, we're about to go to church. Is this how Christians act? That got her but flap wrinkled and she took off. You'd think that'd be all. But remember we still gotta go to church with this women. We get to church and we're waiting outside cause it ain't started yet and Lance goes over to her to calmly talk to her. I didn't go over there cause I was the one screaming at her so I didn't think that was a good idea. So everything said here is from Lance. Ma'am I'm over here to calmly talk this out with you. No. I'm the adult here. Listen. Okay. Talk then, Lance said. I don't remember what she said but she started to raise her voice and yell at him again so he said, you really gonna yell and make a fool of yourself at church. Go ahead. I was around 15 feet away and I could see her purse her lips and ball her fists. She says, you're a child. I'm not a child. I'm 19 years old and acting way more like an adult than you are. And credit to Lance cause he definitely was. Then she tells him again, get your daddy. I put him in the dirt and jack your jaw. Keep in mind Lance is 5'11 and 210, a very stocky boy and my daddy's 6 feet and 230 something. Now cue my dad walking up to me. I tell him that Jenna's mama tried to run us off the road and now yelling at Bubba. I could see him get all tough. You can tell when he takes big steps and rearranges his shoulders. He walks over there and she immediately takes a chill pill. Daddy asks what's going on and she goes, well your son passed me in a no passing zone, and I swear to them, the way she said it like it was no big deal is baffling. My dad has grown up here all his life so he goes where? She tells him and he says that's a passing zone, and even if it ain't you're gonna swerve at them? She goes yup. Then she starts calling my brother a child and says she doesn't care if she swerved that she was right to do so. That's when Lance goes okay I ain't talking to you no more, and they walk back over to us. Seriously. Every person I ever met this woman is the most childish and psychotic. She's a member of our church and her admitting she tried running a vehicle full of children off the road and proud of it makes me furious. 
and she also had her daughter in the car with her and she was mortified her mama did that you could see it on her face. I've road raged but never gotten into this much of a confrontation with someone over the road. This is it for now, but I'll update if there's any more to the story. Thank y'all and watch out for crazy Baptists road raging women. Okay so bear with me. This happened when I was a kid and I double checked the story with my family. So this was in the mid 80s. I was about 7 at home with two of my older sisters, 8 and 11-ish, and two cousins, 7 and 8-ish. All five girls. My sister, 11, was in charge of babysitting us four younger girls. You have to picture what our house looked like to understand what happened. It was a two-story box house with a flat roof and a small box front porch, also with a flat roof. I can't remember what we were doing but we were all in the house. We kept hearing noises coming from the roof like walking and what sounded like rocks being dropped down the downspouts. You know kids, we thought of a squirrel or something. But it kept happening. Then my older sister said something about how maybe someone climbed the huge tree beside the house and got on the roof. We were all scared because we knew there was a roof access point in the bedroom that I shared with one of my sisters. What if he could get inside? My oldest sister told my other sister and one of our cousins to walk across the street to the corner store cross an empty gravel parking lot, and on the way back, look up and see if they could see someone on the roof. So the girls, both about eight years old, walked one halfway across the parking lot and being curious kids, turned around, looked up and saw a guy in one of those totally 80s guys crop top football jerseys, think Johnny Depp in A Nightmare on Elm Street. He was couched down on the roof. The girls came running home freaking out and told my older sister about the guy. My older sister, freaking out first went to the neighbor's house to use their deck to see if she could see on our roof but couldn't see anything. She came home and then called the police. It felt like it took them ages to show up. When they got there, I don't think they believed a word we said. They thought a bunch of little kids were making up this story for attention. One cop drove down the road, up a hill about a block away, to see if they could see anything but the way the roof was, you couldn't see a person if they were laying. Then these cops tell us kids that we had to go upstairs and check everywhere to see if we found anyone. Five little girls from ages 7 to 11 went upstairs, scared crapless, cry, to look for this man, knowing about the roof access. We all cried not wanting to go but they said we had to. To this day I remember how scared I was. I remember looking but how well do little kids look right? The cops didn't listen to us, didn't check out the house, inside or out and left. We were so scared to be left home with the guy out there, who knows where. We didn't know if he was just laying down on the roof or jumped down or somehow got in and was hiding. My mom finally got home a few hours later and we told her what happened and my mom explained to us that there was a lock on the roof access and no one could get in but she checked anyway. Then went to check out the outside. There were clear footprints in the dirt, dug and well from him jumping off the roof, onto the porch and off into the flower bed. Oh my mom was so steaming mad when she realized we told the truth and weren't believed by the police. We went to the police station the next day and we were all separated and interviewed. We all told the same story. My mom went up one side of the cops and down the other. We never found out who the guy was or why he was there. Did he know it was a house with five little girls home alone? This was in the mid-2000s when I was in about second or third grade. I lived in the rural Midwest and went to a decently sized elementary school. For a few weeks, a friend of mine I chatted with often was absent from school. I was confused and curious as to why he hadn't been attending school for so many days. Soon, I found out from other kids at the school that he was taking time to rest and recover after a very traumatic experience in his family. I'm not going to reveal names as for one, I do not remember the boy's name and I don't want to reveal any personal info about those whose names I do remember. For the sake of easier reading, I will call the boy who was absent Mike. The standard chats and occasional gossip I'd share with friends on the playground and in the cafeteria took a very dark turn once word got out of why Mike was absent. One day, a friend of mine, let's call him, Chad, told us that Mike's mother was murdered. Hearing later from some of the school employees and my own parents, I found out that this horrific act was carried out by the boyfriend of Mike's sister. The killer had snuck into the bedroom of his girlfriend's mother. He then either stabbed her to death or slit her throat in her sleep. I don't remember the exact details. I was only around 9 or 10 years old, so hearing this was especially shocking. Having something like that happen so close to me, even more so. 
I'm not quite sure how reliable this is, but according to Chad, the mother didn't want her daughter's relationship to get sexual until she and her boyfriend were married. She also didn't want them to get married until they had been together for a few years and she had gotten to know the guy well enough to know that he would treat her daughter well. The sister's boyfriend was furious at this, and believed that the best way to get what he wanted would be to eliminate what he saw as a roadblock. I was disgusted and disturbed at such a selfish, pathetic, and creepy motive. This so-called man murdered an innocent woman just because he wanted to have sex with her daughter, and was delusional enough to believe that she would go along with him after he carried out the gruesome act. I remember one day on the way back home from school, my mom pointed out that the funeral procession was happening around the neighborhood we lived in. It honestly surprised me that it was that close to where we live. I remember seeing Mike in his black suit and tie, with a very somber and serious look on his face. At school I remember him being a pretty easygoing, cheerful guy who enjoyed cracking jokes with me. Seeing him like this hurt and I can only imagine how this terror has affected him. Horror like this seems like it would stay with you. But honestly, I only just now remembered it, and there's still so many details that I don't quite recall. I don't even remember if Mike ever came back to school for the rest of the semester or not. If he did, I have no idea what I would have even said to him. What the hell do you even say to someone who has just had their life so cruelly changed at a young age? What do you say to someone whose mother was just taken from them by some heartless monster? Something about my memory of this being hazy unnerves me, and I wonder if being hit with this cold reality at such a young age influenced my often cynical outlook on the world. I hope Mike and his family are doing well, because no one deserves to go through that. This isn't something that I talk about much. You can believe it or think I'm making things up. I don't care. I just feel that I had to get this out. A little backstory before I begin. This story takes place just outside of Baltimore, Maryland in a place called Fort Armistead. It was an Army Coastal Defense Fort from 1901 to 1920 and was abandoned in 1923. It was later turned into a Baltimore City Park. You can easily Google the history for more info. Honestly, it's a pretty shady area, but it's right on the water and has some beautiful views. The abandoned fort is still there, but it is now covered with graffiti from top to bottom. With the ruins also being surrounded by trees, it makes for some beautiful scenery. I'll try and explain the layout as best I can. It's important. You park on the side and walk up the dirt path to an opening in the trees. The ruins are to your left when you enter, and it runs long ways along the left side. The right side drops down a hill into trees with the path, but there are stairs periodically that will bring you down to the bottom level of the ruins to that path that leads to the bunker tunnels. So the actual top part of the fort is two parts, and then there's the part down the hill with the path that runs along the front of the fort. The top portion had the main drag where most of the artwork is. You can also look down old chutes into the bunkers below. The top part of the fort is the best part, scenery-wise. And the only way to access the top of the fort is by staircases on each end of the ruins. The stairs closest to the entrance are basically non-existent, so one has to walk all the way across the fort to reach the other set of stairs at the other end. They were in better shape. Once you're up at the top, it's nothing but trees and the water in our line. But if you look down, you can clearly see the bottom dirt path down by the bunkers. The top part is completely flat concrete and juts out in places over towards the trees. A really nice area to just enjoy the views and chill. I moved to Maryland from Connecticut a couple years ago. My sister Katie still lived in CT, but she would come visit me from time to time. I have been to Fort Armistead before and even explored the bunkers. Not much down there but still fun to explore. I loved the upper part of the ruins and wanted to show Katie while she was visiting that summer. So, one afternoon we decided to go up and she could see the fort. We got in my car and I drove us up the bumpy, car-destroying road that leads to the park. I parked up on the side of the road next to the entrance to the fort ruins, and we headed up the short dirt path that led to the entrance. Now, I'm naturally extremely protective of my baby sister. So when I noticed this guy, I was immediately on guard. He was in his forties kind of disheveled, but he didn't look homeless. I don't remember much about his looks, though. He was full on staring at us, and I was trying not to obviously stare, but I knew I had to keep my eye on him. I turned to Katie who was completely oblivious and I decided to not say anything. She was enjoying all the artwork and the trees and the cool concrete ruins around us. I didn't want to ruin our experience over a weird feeling. 
we continued up the front to the ruins since the steps closest to us didn't exist anymore. As we were walking, we came across another guy, also in his forties. He was just leaning up against the ruins watching us, too. We walked past him, Katie still oblivious. Me even more on guard. That hair-raising fear started to creep in, but I pushed it away. I didn't want to ruin this time with my sister. So we pressed on. We get to the stairs, and this is where things get creepy for me. We climb the stairs and get up to the top. I took a minute to enjoy the time with my sister until I got a bad feeling. I look down and see the guy from the entrance speed walking down the path down by the bunkers and into the woods at the end of the path, still watching us the whole time. My mind went into panic mode. I had been there enough times to know that the path down by the bunkers loops around in the trees and completely bypasses the lower level to the ruins and leads straight up to where we were. There was only one set of steps, but that meant we had to go towards where the guy would soon emerge from. The only other option was a 15 plus foot drop down onto concrete, or a smaller drop all the way on the other side where the old stairs were. I made a split decision and told Katie that we had to go, now. We ran down those awkward-sized and half-broken concrete steps and basically ran back towards the entrance. The second guy moved and was down closer by the entrance. I just hurried my sister along past him, hoping he wouldn't try anything. I didn't look back until I unlocked my car. As Katie climbed in, I opened my door and looked back before climbing in myself. Any thought that I had had about just being paranoid or making something out of nothing quickly melted away as I looked over and saw the first man standing partially hidden by trees in the entrance, just staring at me with cold, angry eyes. He had chased us back. That realization was enough for me to jump in the car and just get out as fast as I could. Katie was still pretty confused, especially since she knew nothing of what was happening until I said we had to go. I basically told her someone was following us and that we needed to leave. I explained more in the car as we were driving away. She was unsurprisingly horrified. I don't blame her. I was, too. That was the first and only time in my life that I felt that kind of fear. But even with realizing what was happening, my first instinct was to protect my sister and just get out of there. I'm still kicking myself for leaving my safety keychain hanging off my shifter. It had pepper spray on it. But I'm thankful we weren't put in a position where I had to actually use it. I still wonder what I saved us from that day. What that man's intentions were. I shudder thinking about it. I try to store the whole thing away, but the thought somehow creeps into my mind on an almost daily basis. I'm just glad Katie is safe. Hell, I'm glad I'm safe. I haven't been back to Fort Armistead since. When I bring it up, Katie says that while it was really creepy, it was still a beautiful place. I was in a toxic, borderline abusive, friendship with a girl from the ages of 9 to 12. Here's some background information to give you a little understanding as to what my life was like back in the late 2000s, early 2010s. I grew up in a very tumultuous household, my parents hated each other, and my extended family, along with my immediate family, were plagued by mental illness and drug addiction. So, needless to say, I was a very anxious child who was drawn to unstable people and suffixed it to say, they were drawn to me. I was a shy, 11-year-old girl, who like many others before me, used the internet as a way to vent my frustrations and anger about my home life. This was the time where AOL was the main source of communication used between friends, and I was no stranger to this along with MySpace and Facebook. However, I wasn't like the typical pre-teens of this era, or so I thought. I kept my profiles private, never accepted a follow or a friend request that I didn't know, and never shared my location on these said profiles. This is the part where I introduce Tanya. Tanya isn't her name of course, as I don't want to use her real name in case she just so happens to read this thread, watches the YouTube channel, or listens to the podcast. So, we'll just call her Tanya. Tanya and I met in elementary school, one of the points in my life where my family situation was quite volatile, and in retrospect, I think she sensed this. I was vulnerable and Tanya took advantage of my innocence. She never really displayed any signs of her true intentions in the beginning, as they never usually do. She would do shady things every now and again, manipulate me into begging my mom to stay on the computer until the wee hours of the morning so we could go on NSFW websites, ghost me when I didn't give her my favorite pen, or yell at me when I couldn't perfect a guitar solo on Guitar Hero. She did some other things to me that I believe my brain blocked out due to trauma. My mom didn't like her either. 
parents always have a weird intuition when it comes to friends and I wish to God I would have listened to my mom before Tanya did what she did to me. Tanya's behavior changed for the worse when we turned 11. Tanya was openly jealous of my success in school. Granted she was incredibly smart herself, but she always made it a point to mock me for having great grades and would always comment that since I wasn't pretty enough, having good grades would be a nice balance. Nice, right? It took me a while to build my self-esteem up after all of the snide remarks she would make about my weight and my face and only now as a 22-year-old do I think that I'm beautiful and have a wonderful figure. Anyways, back to Tanya. As a result of her jealousy and growing resentment towards me, she began to plot my downfall. I make no exaggeration either. This girl literally tried to ruin my self-worth even more than she already had. It started in sixth grade. Tanya and I were remarkably close that year and I wanted to do everything with her. We would talk all day in school and we would chat all night on AIM. On one particular evening, Tanya and I were talking about boys. Being that we were hormonal preteens, our conversations would usually turn on to who we liked in school that day. Being that I had a horrible relationship with my father, I didn't really trust boys, even from an early age, so it was rare if I developed a crush on one. I remember Tanya and I's conversation going a little something like this. Tanya, do you know Mark? Me, the kid in my class? Yeah. Why? Tanya, I heard he likes you. Me, what? No way. Tanya, totally. He told me. You want me to talk to him and give him your username? Me, why yes of course. OMG thank you Tanya. My heart was racing. A boy like me? Impossible. When Tanya told me that she would give Mark my username for AIM I nearly exploded in my seat. Eleven-year-old me couldn't believe I was going to have my first real boyfriend. How wrong I was. Fast forward to the next night. I was getting ready for bed when I heard the famous AOL ding sound off on my iPod touch. You know the sound I'm talking about. When I checked the notification, it was a message from MarkyBoy99. I don't remember his username so we'll just go with something like this. I turned red. Tanya had really talked to Mark and gave him my user. She was truly the best. He messaged me with the usual, hey, emphasis on the three Y's, and I responded, hey. I didn't want to come off as desperate so I only used one Y. Not even one minute later he messaged me back. We talked all night, about everything, our days, how school was, what type of silly bands we liked, typical 11 year old stuff. I have to admit, I was smitten right off the bat. I think it was partly because I never really had a boy like me before and the other part being that my self-esteem was so low that I never thought a boy would be capable of liking me. Also, it could have been because Mark was one of the most popular boys in school at that time. He played football, was mouthy to the teachers and was extremely outgoing, all the things a young girl would be attracted to. We talked for months, my puppy loved growing for him more and more every time we chatted. Of course, I never spoke to him on the phone, nor did I get his phone number because why would you do that, right? All the while I was speaking to him, Tanya would be gassing me up, telling me how proud she was of me, and that I deserved a boyfriend. My suspicions of Mark only began to grow when I attempted to approach him during school hours. Again, I had anxiety so I would never really speak to Mark outside of AIM. When I went to talk to him, Mark looked confused, as if he's never had a conversation with me before in his life. He turned away from me on the playground and walked to be with his other friends. Oh, weird. This wasn't like him. He was usually so chatty with me online that I expected him to welcome me with open arms in person. My ego was bruised. My little 11-year-old mind tried to rationalize this behavior by chalking it up to him not wanting to talk to the nerd since he was so popular and that he just preferred to keep our relationship online. I told Tanya the news and she seemed to be genuinely heartbroken for me. She was just as angry as I was and vowed to confront Mark later that day during music class. I was happy. Tanya had my back and as far as I knew she was going to tell Mark off about him being a total jerk to me. Well, it worked. Later that night I got a message from Mark telling me how sorry he was for ignoring me and that he was just going through some family things. Back in love, I was. I didn't care that Mark ignored me during school, I didn't care that he rejected my advances in person. As long as I had him to talk to online and Tanya's support, I was fine. I even told my mom about him and she was extremely happy for me as well. Another month passed and it was March 31st, 2011. Mark messaged me and told me that he had something very important to tell me the next day. The anxiety began. What was it? What did he have to tell me? 
At that point I considered myself and Mark to be dating so I was anxious that he was either going to break it off with me or that he was going to make us public in school the next day. I told my mom and Tanya, almost on the verge of tears with how excited and nervous I was. Well, the next day, April 1st, 2011 rolled around and this is what followed. It was around 7 p.m. and I was on Club Penguin as I usually was until I heard a familiar ding. It was Mark. It was time for the news I'd been waiting for all day. Mark, hey babe, winky face. Me, OMG hey. I've been waiting for you to chat me all night. Mark, sorry babe, I was at practice, sad face. Are you ready for the news? I was shaking with anticipation at this point. Even writing this now, a whole swell of emotions are resurfacing. Me, yes, of course. It was then that Mark sent me a picture. I opened it but only it wasn't Mark, it was Tanya, and she was holding a handwritten sign that said, Happy April Fool's Day. At first, I started laughing and I mean it was an ugly laugh. Of course, it was a prank. Tanya had gotten me so good, right? Right? Well, wrong. It was then when the realization hit me that I started to sob. I felt betrayed and like a loser. Tanya had been behind Mark all along and she had been planning this big joke since October of 2010. She had been so jealous that she pretended to be someone else and string along my emotions when she knew I was already in a rough place mentally. She told me that I was stupid to even think that Mark would even like me in the first place and that I was dumb for not asking for his number. Tanya had been at this for six months. An 11-year-old girl plotted Mark, used him to make me think that a boy liked me, and tricked me into believing that I had a boyfriend, all the while telling me when we hung out that she was happy for me and that Mark and I were a cute couple. I told my mom who then called her mom. My mother was livid, to say the least. She told Tanya's mom to tell her daughter never to speak to me again. I was crushed. My best friend of three years had catfished me because she simply wanted to play a joke. I was loyal to her and she toyed with my emotions because she could. Tanya had tried multiple times to guilt trip me into being her friend again in the months that followed leading into seventh grade. One of the more memorable and honestly messed up times was when she messaged me a few days after my birthday in August to tell me that her mother had just died in a horrible car crash, her body was dismembered and they could only find her head and wedding ring. As anyone would be, I was in tears. Tanya's mother was nothing but lovely to me and learning that she died in such a violent way crushed my soul. I started talking to Tanya again, asking her when her mother's funeral would be. Tanya then revealed to me seconds later after speaking to her about the grisly details over her mother's passing that she was kidding and was pranking me again and that I was stupid to believe her. She even sent a video of her laughing at me. I was disgusted. Who would even say something like that? What now 12-year-old would message someone that their mother was dismembered in a car crash? She then revealed her ugly and quite frankly evil intentions when we were at the beginning of 7th grade and she became friends with a girl named Kaylee. They both invited me to sit with me at their lunch table and because I was desperate for friends, I stupidly accepted, only to be met with hordes of insults and laughter behind my back every chance I wasn't looking. Tanya then messaged me one night telling me to kill myself and that the world would be a much better place without me in it. She had Kaylee tell me to go jump off of a bridge. Tanya told me that she hated me and was never really my friend to begin with, that I deserved all of the pain she put me through the year prior. I again told my mom who then called the police. She had had enough of Tanya and so had I. For four years I had put up with Tanya's malicious behavior, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. My mom made me delete my AIM account and Tanya's mom told her to never contact me again or else. My mom also advised me to move lunch tables but I was hell-bent on not letting Tanya win. For the entirety of seventh grade, I sat at the same table as Tanya, only I spoke to my friends at the other side of the table. I never spoke to her looked at her, or gave her any sort of attention. Kaylee was scared to death of me afterward too, as the police had gotten in contact with her family as well. It's been 10 years and I still haven't spoken to Tanya. I'm now 22 years old, have two bachelor's degrees, one in psychology and the other in history, and I am now working towards my master's in clinical social work. Tanya did other things to me, too that I could write a whole other story about. But I think writing this one helped give me closure on the part of my childhood that scarred me for years. I thank God for my mom stepping in when she did because I don't know where I'd be without her. As for Tanya, I don't know where she is or what she's doing and I really rather not. On the off chance she stumbles upon this story, I have a message for her.
your jealousy and wishes for death upon me did not win and I truly hope that karma does not come around one day to bite you in the ass. Tanya, let's never meet again. My co-worker, I will call her Jane, is 33 years old, a virgin, and a very devout Christian. Her family is very strict and very religious. I'm not bashing on the religion in any way, I was raised a Christian myself. These people though, they just seem to take their beliefs to a new extreme. Think of them as the Flanders from The Simpsons. I mentioned that Jane is a virgin, because she has honestly never even had a boyfriend before. She's been on a few dating websites as of late, but she's usually very strict when it comes to the types of guys she would date. She can be kind of stuck up, which has gained her very little popularity. She recently met a guy on OkCupid, okay let's call him Miguel. Miguel claims to live in a bigger city than ours, an hour away, we are in the middle of nowhere in Kansas, and that he is 35 years old, also claims to be a virgin, and takes an interest in Jane. They chat for a while, and she's very excited. Once they establish a fondness for each other, he claims that he has $250,000 in savings, and a job at Cessna that pays $65 an hour. He has a nice apartment and two cars, one of which is a 69 Dodge Charger. Sounds too good to be true, right? We all agree. Everyone, but her. They agree to meet for a first date, and he says he'll drive down here to see her. While driving down here, he claims to get into an accident on the interstate and is left hospitalized. Jane is devastated, the rest of us, who she was telling this to, all just assumed that he was lying to her and this was his way of getting out of the date and her finding out that he was scum. We didn't think there'd be any more communication afterwards. We were wrong. They continued talking, and shortly after getting out of the hospital, he claimed he was hit by a car crossing the street. His life apparently took a turn for the worst, as he claimed he was laid off from Cessna, his apartment was burglarized, and all of his money in his other car were seized by the IRS due to a misunderstanding in his taxes from a few years back. Completely believable stories, right? Much to our dismay, Jane decides she doesn't care about these things, and she is willing to continue talking to the man. He soon starts calling her daily and coming over once a week to visit her at work. At this point, we get to meet this guy. And he comes off as your typical loser with a beer belly who lays around on the couch all day, yelling at his woman to bring him a beer. Despite all of the money he claims to have, he wears clothes that are way too big for him, usually sweatpants and flip-flops. This earned him the nickname, Flip Flops Amongst Us at Work. He has problems making eye contact with people when he talks to them, and has the creepiest smile. We know right away that he doesn't seem very trustworthy. Three weeks into their relationship, he shows up at our work and proposes to Jane. She gladly agrees, as we all shake our heads in disbelief. He tells us he got a new job working for Microsoft down in the city. We did our research. There are no Microsoft jobs over there. Unless you're working in selling products at Best Buy, and he tells her that he's now seeing a therapist for his anger and jealousy issues. Many red flags are going off in our heads at this point but Jane doesn't seem to mind any of it. He moves down here to be with her, after claiming that his family disowned him for wanting to marry a Christian. He claims they're all devout Catholics and that's the reason why she'll never get to meet them. As if this isn't ridiculous and over the top enough, things start to get creepier from here. He tells us that he has a new job for $25 an hour as the head engineer at Exide Manufacturing. The head of HR at Exide is actually a relative of a friend of ours, so we asked her about this. They never heard of this man, and the position he claims he has doesn't exist. We try to tell Jane about it, but she brushes off all of our comments and claims that we are thinking too much about it or we're just jealous. He starts picking her up and dropping her off from work every single day, as well as picking her up for all of her lunches. She still believes he has a full-time job and that he's only doing this because of how much he loves her. We start to feel that he's just wanting to know where she is at all times. He asks the maintenance man at our work, after their first meeting, to be the best man at his wedding. This doesn't strike Jane as odd, because apparently Miguel is just untrusting of most people and has no friends of his own, they all want him for his money. Her parents loan him their spare van, so he can use that to drive from now on. To our shock, her parents are already buying baby clothes and supplies for the couple. They are completely won over by the man. I think they're just blinded by the fact that their daughter finally has someone and will give them grandkids. Which is a really sad thought. By this point, we've noticed her personality growing slightly more stressed and depressed as time goes on. 
Now, if you've read up to this point, you're probably thinking, oh, she's just another dumb girl who picked up a sleazeball guy who's milking her for all she's worth. And you're definitely not wrong. We all thought the same thing, until she one day dropped this little bomb on us. He has just recently told her that he used to be spec ops in the military, the Air Force, to be exact, and they've decided that they want him to work for them again. They'll pay him 75k for working 3 days slash 3 weeks slash 3 months. The story always changes, something she doesn't find suspicious at all. Testing military equipment that's too dangerous and could be life-threatening. He agrees to the work and we all think he's copping out of the relationship. She then tells us that if she wishes to remain in contact with him, they'll have to get married as soon as possible and she'll have to be prepared to move away with him. She explains that the military has been calling her and making stops at their house to explain to her that she'll have to marry him immediately, and she needs to be prepared to move to an undisclosed location at any given moment. From that location, she'll not be allowed to make any contact with friends or family since all that is going on is top secret and she has to prove that she can be trusted. Obviously, all of us are now alarmed. Everyone, but her. And her family. They are delighted that she's with a military man and are proud that she gets to be a part of something much bigger. The rest of us are trying to figure out what on earth he can be plotting. Is she going to be hijacked into human trafficking? Is he going to murder her? One of our co-workers has just called the human trafficking hotline and they think that this definitely sounds like something they've seen before. Unfortunately, they can't do anything about it until he actually makes a move and takes her. We're looking into contacting our local police to see if there's anything that can be done about this, before she gets the phone call that tells her when they have to make their move. This is all so crazy, we don't know what to expect, or just what danger she's really in. Any thoughts would be appreciated, and thank you for reading. This is a true story about my life that began roughly four years ago when I turned 16. I have been weighing whether or not I should post because I'm a little afraid the person this story is about will somehow see it and know it is me writing about them. Nevertheless, here I am. The minute I turned 16 I knew I wanted a job. The first one I was able to get, and the one I would have for the next couple years, was a restaurant job. This wasn't fast food but it also wasn't a full service restaurant. It was somewhere in the middle. I was a cashier and very 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 shy. This is important to note as some things that I'll talk about later continually happened because of how I was too resistant in speaking up. I'd say about halfway through my first year at the restaurant was when Chris was first hired. My first impression of Chris was this extremely tall, extremely loud, charismatic teddy bear. This was also the impression he gave the rest of the staff and the impression that remained with them the entire time he worked there. I honestly don't fully remember the first time I met him. Again, I was very shy and just liked to do my job in peace. All I really recall is that my manager was talking with him and introduced me as one of the only high schoolers on the staff and someone she thought was funny. I remember him telling me he was going to find me later to tell him a few jokes but I don't remember anything after that. From the beginning, it just seemed like he was suddenly stuck to me. What I do remember first is the hugs. Chris was a big hugger. He loved to hug every girl on the staff when he first arrived and when he was about to leave. I would feel very uncomfortable by this because not only did I hate being touched by a man I did not know, but he was also a man that was nearing 30 years old. Whenever he would come over to me, I would always find something to busy myself with in a corner so he wouldn't slash couldn't easily hug me. When he did end up catching me off guard and getting me into a hug, he would really linger and rub my lower back. No one else around me seemed to care or seemed uncomfortable by the constant hugs and this was a large factor in me feeling like I was overreacting. There was time I went in on my day off to put a request off in the office. I talked with one of my managers in the front for a few minutes when suddenly she heard someone talking over the headset to her. She looked at me, smiled and said, Chris sees you and wants you to wait until he's finished in the back so he can give you a hug. I couldn't control my grimace and told her I was out of there. She just laughed and I heard say over the headset I was running away as I walked out the door. For the next couple weeks, he didn't speak to me but I felt him stare all the time. It was a nice break from the hug attempts, but eventually he got over it and continued like before. Another particular hug I remember is when we were both alone in the back. I walked back there to get something and Chris was the only other person there. Usually the dishwashers or the manager or another server was there too. It made me almost stumble a step and I briefly hesitated. 
he always made me nervous to talk to others around and now we were alone and I knew he would start some sort of conversation. He saw me stumble and laughed and told me to come in. The entire conversation is a blur but I remember him asking me how I was feeling that day. I responded with some sort of dumb joke like, oh, you know, good, just dead inside. I thought he would laugh and we would move on. Instead he pouted his face, ah, and went in for the hug. I maneuvered it as best as I could into a side hug and patted his back. As I did, I felt his other hand press against my lower stomach and slowly rub it in a circle. He leaned down into my ear and whispered, it's okay, Chris will make it all better. I remember going white in the face, fake laughing, and backing right out of there. The entire exchange took less than 15 seconds but it destroyed my mood for the rest of my shift. And although this was definitely the worst interaction I've had with him so far, I still did not say a thing to anyone. The next thing I remember is the singing. Chris was I believe around 28 and a college dropout. His dream was to be a famous singer. He sang to customers, he sang in the back kitchen and dish room, and he most definitely sang to me. He made up songs about his high school girl and would walk back and forth by my station and sing what seemed like at an insane volume. I would cringe into my register and try to talk over his voice to the customers. I think the songs were really when I understood that although he was very touchy with everyone, he seemed especially interested in me. Every time we worked a shift together or saw each other. I say this as he was always in the restaurant even when he wasn't working. Seriously every day it was like he lived there. He would ask me to come over to his apartment after work. He would talk about how he wanted to show me some new thing he put in or bought or how he was going to throw a game night with the rest of the staff. He would seem upset when I said I couldn't because of school in the morning or because my mom wouldn't want me to as the rest of the staff was mostly college students. There was one time in particular I remember when I went to IHOP with the rest of the staff after a shift because it was the first time I ever worked up the courage and felt comfortable enough to hang out with them outside of work. Chris was there but I barely spoke with him and sat on the other side of the table. However, when I got up to go to the bathroom and then walked out after, Chris was waiting for me. I think he had pretended to need to go to the bathroom also but had just waited until I walked out. It was nearing when we were leaving and he grabbed my arm and asked if I would want to ride with him back to the restaurant where the rest of our cars were, most of us carpooled, instead of who I came with. I brushed quickly past him and jokingly said I thought my co-worker I rode with might be offended by that and ran back to our table before he said anything else. Although all of these things made me uncomfortable, I didn't truly feel a bit of fear until the movie night. This happened later into my time at the restaurant and I had made a couple friends there. Two girls that were around my age and I had become fairly close at this point and decided that after their shifts on Friday night, I would come pick them up and we would go see a movie at the mall close by. We laughed and talked and had a really good time. I remember really enjoying the movie all the way through to the end. However, when it ended and we all filed out, one of them looked briefly behind her and then stopped in her tracks. We both whipped our heads around immediately when she called out a confused Chris. It was then when I saw him kind of embarrassed and half hiding behind the staircase. He walked over, laughed, and then said, wow, this is so crazy. We then told him to wait a minute while we had to go to the bathroom. After rushing in, we all looked at each other with the widest eyes. I just started stumbling with my words and then they filled me in. They said he had been there during their shift earlier and overheard them talking about how I was going to pick them up for a movie. He asked which movie and they told him. They said he didn't ask anything else so either they were lying, but it really would not take a genius to figure out the location, the nearest one to the restaurant, and time, the one after their shifts ended, if he knew which movie. Although I could tell it had also weirded them out a bit. I was by far the most uncomfortable and they tried to calm me down by saying, oh, you know he has a little crush on you. He probably just knew you were gonna be there and wanted to come. This did not calm me down. They ended up deciding to go to McDonald's together afterwards and I faked that I wasn't feeling good and just had him take them while I went home. I'm sure I didn't fool anyone. I remember seeing his car everywhere I went although I knew he lived in the next town over. It was a car I remember well and whenever I had a shift. I would always check the parking lot for it to prepare myself. Although I don't want to say exactly how, it was definitely identifiable. I saw it rushing past me at the mall. I saw it outside of my local grocery store. And I even saw it briefly leaving my neighborhood. Every time I felt a rush of anxiety but again, I never said a thing. To anyone. One of the final things that happened when he still worked there was at my high school graduation. As I said before. I was one of the only high school students out of a staff of about 40, 
and definitely the only high schooler at my specific high school. I was close to a select few at my work, but not close enough that I thought anyone should come or be invited to my graduation, especially because it was an hour away and that's a lot to ask someone. The only people that knew where and when it was were friends graduating with me and my family. The afternoon went on and I had a great time. After the ceremony was over, everyone was to leave the building and find their friends and family outside in the parking lot. We were arranged by last name so I had to wander a bit while calling my mom in order for us to find each other. It was then that I saw Chris. He was leaning against the side of the building and looking around intensely. Although he could have possibly been there for someone else, I knew in my heart he was looking for me. I quickly walked back into the crowd and told my mom to meet me in the complete opposite direction. We eventually found each other, took a few pictures, and then I begged them to leave. I remember them being a bit surprised, but I chalked it up to me being tired from waking up early that morning. When I had a shift later that week, Chris came up to me and told me he had something to say. He revealed that he found out online when and where my graduation was and planned to surprise me. He said he was sad that he never found me but wanted to give me something. He handed me an envelope with a card inside and told me to open it later. I wish I could tell you all what it says, but I never opened it. I put it in my car and I either threw it out or it was just lost. Kind of a boring ending, but Chris continued to talk to me and I saw his car around a few more times, but nothing else happened like that. He was fired for no showing a couple times and I eventually moved out of state for college. I never saw him again and am so grateful for that. There were many more little things that he did throughout the years we both worked there, but then this story would be insanely long and I can't even begin to remember them all anyway. I think I didn't ever say anything for a couple reasons. First, of course, I was that shy and naive girl who thought I was overreacting especially because no one seemed to think how he acted was weird. In fact, they all really liked him and thought he was cool. And second, he didn't really completely behave like a stalker in a movie personality wise. He was very direct in wanting my attention or wanting to be near me and didn't hide that in front of my other co-workers. He came over when we called him out at the movies and he was honest in going to my graduation after the fact. Obviously I see everything crystal clear now. But it's almost as if I didn't say anything because I really didn't want to believe what was happening to me. Long time lurker on this channel, but recent events regarding the offending party in this story has made me reflect a great deal on what happened to me and my family. Around the time I turned 18, I was dating a girl named Allison who had a history of getting around, if you catch my drift. Unfortunately, I didn't find out about the true extent of her sordid history until after she left me for an up-and-coming male stripper in a larger city 100 miles north of our city. At the time I was dating Allison, I was actively playing guitar in a rock band in town with guys who were a year or two years older than me. Around the time that everything started going south with Allison, I was still living at home and beginning my first semester of college. Typical weekends involved our band playing at one of the various outdoor venues before Friday night football in town. Afterwards, Allison, my band members, and their significant others would typically go to IHOP or Denny's after the football game and plan for our next show. This particular weekend in question, tension between Allison and I was particularly strong as I had learned that she previously dated a guy I knew from high school named Ronald that was clearly mentally unstable. In one of the most amusing ways I could possibly find out about one of Allison's many ex-boyfriends, I made the mistake of talking to Allison's 88-year-old grandmother, who was in the mid-stages of senility. While Allison's grandmother never cared for me, she made it clear on this occasion that she fucking hated my family because you're all a bunch of spineless French blood-sucking lawyers who are trying to kill our town, and that Ronald was a strong, virile German boy that was perfect for Allison. Yes, those are the exact words she spoke. Allison's grandmother also let it be known that Ronald was frequently calling Allison and leaving flowers at her house at least once a week. For the record, I'm French, my family is full of lawyers, Ronald is German, Allison was very British, to the point of a latent accent that remained after living over 10 years in the southern United States, and Allison's grandmother was mean-spirited and borderline batshit insane. As I had no idea Allison dated Ronald in the past, I let her know I was not pleased about her lack of candor in this matter, and that I worried for her safety because Ronald was a very unstable individual. In high school, Ronald was a year behind me and had a reputation for routinely making death threats to other students and often attempting to back up his threats by bringing knives to school almost on a daily basis. Likely, 
the only reason that one of my friends managed to escape Ronald's unstable wrath was the fact that we had metal detectors at every entrance to the school and Ronald never seemed to realize that the detectors, while old and slightly outdated, still managed to consistently alert on knives. Ronald had been in and out of a juvenile delinquency facility, an inpatient mental health facility, and our school district's most severe form of in-school suspension each year he was in high school. Petty theft, burglary, an arson charge that was later dropped, and operating as a small-time meth and weed dealer were among the different activities he engaged in during high school. However, the most eventful incident that cemented his reputation occurred during my senior year when Ronald felt it necessary to attempt to slash a guy's tires with a katana sword during the middle of the night for cheating him out of a couple magic, the gathering cards. Now, Ronald's family was equally as colorful as he was. His father was in the state prison system for at least 20 years for engaging in organized criminal activity, large-scale drug dealing in our state. His mother was a heroin addict who was in and out of treatment facilities in the criminal justice system for petty theft, and his older, college-age sister ironically dated my older brother and was fairly sane. As Ronald's parents were next to non-existent, Ronald's hyper-religious aunt also lived in their home. It's also worth noting that Ronald and his aunt were both extreme anime and Japanese culture fans and had amassed a staggering amount of knives, broadswords, katanas, and throwing stars. Ronald's home was literally one block away down the hill from my home. Like much of the urban planning in the southern United States, a $500,000 home can be located within a block or so of sprawling apartment complexes or subdivisions full of dilapidated rental houses. In our case, Ronald's neighborhood was full of the types of individuals that he routinely sold meth and weed to before one of his buyers snitched on him for shorting them the requisite amount of product. Lesson learned, even drug dealers cut corners during an economic recession. With all of that information out of the way, it's worth noting that Ronald never fully accepted the fact that Allison was not interested in dating him long term. As a result of this inconvenient misunderstanding, he routinely showed up around her home while she was out with me. To make matters worse, the batshit insane grandmother kept feeding his delusions that they were still a couple. Allison's parents were both actively engaged in running a family construction business, so they were rarely, if ever, home. In fact, in a total of a year and a half of dating, I probably spoke to her parents less than two hours in total. Now, being 18 years old at the time, I didn't think as clearly as I do now at 25. So, what did I do? I proceeded to bitch and moan to my band members about Allison's omissions and the fact that she dated Ronald. My bass player, a music major two years older than me, never let it be known that he was hiding a substance abuse problem and routinely bought weed from Ronald and or his aunt. So, within two days of complaining to my band, I began receiving text messages from Ronald saying that he had a God-ordained claim to Allison, and if I didn't fuck off, he was divinely authorized to kill me. Once again, being 18, I didn't react as appropriately as I should have. Numerous obscenity-laden text messages were exchanged, numerous hate-filled glances were exchanged, and numerous birds were flipped as we passed each other's respective homes. A little over a week after this Cold War began, I told Allison that my parents had enough of Ronald's harassment and were going to let the cops know about his death threats. I knew I should have seen it coming, but of course, Allison told Ronald. However, I began to have this gut feeling that Ronald was casing my house. I began waking up numerous times at night, checking all the locks in the house, looking out my window, and trying to fall back asleep. Two or three times that week, I saw the shadow of a person standing in our driveway. Pride kept me from honestly believing that Ronald was casing my house and or stalking me. Later in the week, my dad let me know that Ronald had come by his office after school numerous times that week, asking odd questions about me and my work schedule there. I routinely worked for my dad but took time off that week to study for midterms. My dad said he was vague in his answers and had to escort him out of the office because Ronald decided that he would sit in my dad's waiting room two days in a row until I showed up for work. That Friday, my 15-year-old sister, Caroline, reported that Ronald had approached her and her friends after school. From what Caroline's friends told my parents, Ronald tried to hit on Caroline in some sick attempt to get her to tell him exactly where I was at that exact moment because he had a message to deliver. Needless to say, my parents began the process of seeking a restraining order against Ronald for both me and my sister. However, since it was Friday, nothing would get done with the courts until Monday at the earliest. That evening, my band played another outdoor venue before a football game. Ronald was in the crowd, 
blankly staring at me for what felt like the entire time we were playing. As soon as we were done with our set, I found Allison and made a beeline for my car. As I started my car, I looked to my left and saw Ronald in the passenger seat of a white car parked next to me, once again blankly staring at me. I quickly got out of the parking lot, only to look behind me and see the white car following me. I called my dad and he advised me to go immediately to the police station and he would meet me there. The entire time Allison barely said anything. As I entered the police station parking lot, the white car carrying Ronald slowly passed by. My dad showed up minutes later and he made a report and asked that the police conduct an extra patrol around our home, since Ronald lived only a block away. Afterwards, I took Allison home and drove home immediately. Two or three blocks away from my house, I saw the white car again. Not wanting to be the victim of a drive-by or get potentially jumped in my own driveway, I kept driving. I drove in and out of the adjacent subdivisions that led to the interstate. While I was doing this, I called my dad and let him know what was going on. My dad told me to try to lose them on the highway and keep driving to my uncle's house, who lived about 25 miles south of our house. After weaving in and out of the streets, I finally made it to the interstate. Probably going faster than I should have, I lost sight of the white car and made it to my uncle's house. Around 11 p.m., my dad showed up at my uncle's house with one of his friends, who was a local county sheriff's deputy. My dad rode with me back to the house as the deputy followed behind us. Nothing out of the ordinary happened on the way back. After getting back home, my dad's friend said he would stop by Ronald's house and let him know that he was criminally trespassed from coming near our home and made it clear that the sheriff's office and the local police were investigating the matter as a felony stalking case. Honestly, at this point, I figured Ronald would realize that Allison wasn't worth the effort of going back to jail. I was wrong. Three hours later, Around 2 a.m., I received a frantic call from Allison. She essentially told me that I should probably call the cops because Ronald had fucking flipped. Not seconds after hanging up the phone, my bass player texted me that I should get myself, my sister, and my parents out of the house because that crazy bitch is coming for blood. At this point, I was fed up with the entire situation. But, I couldn't deny that I was scared shitless of Ronald based on his behavior the past week. I woke up my dad and told him that Ronald was likely coming to pay me a visit. My dad, a rather irritable tax attorney and a former marine sharpshooter who served in the first Gulf War, got up, got dressed, went to his gun cabinet, and proceeded to pull out two pistols and one of his sentimental AR-15s. Within 10 minutes of the barrage of calls and text messages from everyone telling me to run for the border, my dad and I were staring out our second story window with a night vision monocular looking for Ronald. Ronald finally showed himself after around another 10 minutes. From looking through the monocular, my dad could clearly see that Ronald was standing in the middle of our street carrying a rather large sword. Meanwhile, my sister Caroline was in hysterics, while my mother waited on my dad's word to call the police if Ronald tried to vandalize and or break into the house. As my dad said, Ronald technically wasn't violating the criminal trespass warning since he was just standing in the street. However, Seeing my sister in this type of distress made something in me snap. I recall calmly telling my dad I was going downstairs and would try to go talk him down. Stupid idea, my dad reluctantly agreed and followed closely behind me as I went to our front door, opened the door, and took one tiny step out on our porch. Behind me, my dad kept saying that if he drew his sword or did anything remotely antagonistic, I was to shut the door immediately. At first, I tried to politely engage Ronald and let him know that Allison was no longer dating him and he was misinformed by her grandmother. I quickly realized that Ronald was under the influence of drugs or in the middle of a psychotic episode. After I would speak, he would just blankly stare at me, wide-eyed, and say, the Lord God commands that I take what is mine. I didn't realize it at the time, but my mother had already called the police. I tried a few more times to let him know he was not welcome on our property and that we'd be forced to call the police if he took a step on our law. I told him that I didn't want to fight with him, and that it would be best if we just dropped everything. Again, more of the God is commanding me to end your script from him. Finally, I could tell something shifted in Ronald. His eyes and face tightened, as if he was concentrating intently on something. At this point, he started walking in a semi-brisk pace towards our door. Realizing that I would likely get hacked up, I hauled ass in the house, shut the door, and bolted our three locks. My dad then ran to our other two doors and ensured they were both locked. My mother looked out our dining room window and said that she couldn't see him. 
Pissed at being a prisoner in his own home, my dad decided to look through the peephole on our front door. In all the years I've been around my dad, I've rarely seen him scared. When he looked through the peephole, he jumped back, screaming, son of a bitch. Apparently, Ronald was standing less than two feet away from the door, holding the large sword in the air, waiting to hack my ass into pieces if I opened the door again. Needless to say, the police showed up minutes afterward. Point four cars in fact. Ronald was tossed up multiple times. A limited edition World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King 47-inch broadsword was confiscated and Ronald was again committed to an inpatient mental facility. Charges were filed, but were later dropped because he was found to lack the mental capacity to know the wrongfulness of his actions. Two months later, Allison left me for the aspiring male stripper because she couldn't deal with the drama in our town and needed to be with someone who had career goals. Six months after the incident, Ronald was deemed, treated, and was released back on the streets. He moved from the house down the street into an apartment complex on the other side of town around that time. I stayed in town after finishing a bachelor's degree in law school, so I've seen Ronald around numerous times. I've gone significantly out of my way numerous times to avoid him. To this day, I hate knives and swords. I get nervous as hell being around them. My dad says it's the PTSD from the entire ordeal. He's probably right. Most recently, I unfortunately found out that Ronald had married one of Allison's friends, had a child, and was arrested less than two weeks ago for the murder of his wife. Ironically, I went to law school with the court-appointed attorney representing Ronald. Ronald's apparently looking at death row or life, absent a successful insanity plea. Finding out this unsettling series of events prompted me to write this post. As a female who's been on the game for 15 years now, I've met a load of creeps but only a few only made me feel unsafe. To start off I've always had a laptop since I was in high school, a luxury back then I worked hard to earn enough to buy one. My mom almost took my money I earned for drugs but luckily money I made in tips were in cash so it was easier to hide it from her. At first my mom was mad, I bought myself a laptop but she soon forgot everything. My dad could care less and my older brother already had his own. So I started playing WoW with him at 14 and back then girls were unheard of. So I got the usual creeps who usually backed off after hearing my age or they were young too. But not this guy, this guy loved that I was underage. I was about 16 and used to creepy guys at this point, no longer a noob at the game or fending off the creeps. It was no surprise a new guy in the guild started hitting on me. Now I was 16, dumb young, horny and stupid but I knew I wasn't going to find love on while where you knew no one in real life. Plus I had the ultimate crush on a guy I couldn't have because he was my brother's best friend, but in my mind back then I only wanted him. So it was easy to turn guys down despite being desperate as hell for one guy lol. But that all changed after my brother's friend went off to college. I had a part-time job with my brother's friend but girls at work surrounded him and I became demoralized. I'd never find love. K, 19, year old guy on WoW who made me feel wanted. I had a camera phone so I could send and post pictures at that age and back then I mostly used Facebook, MySpace, and Photobucket. I lost a lot of weight my sophomore year, so I confidently posted bikini pics and sexy pictures thinking I'd lure the attention of my brother's friend who was 19. So when this guy who was also 19 liked me, it didn't faze me. He looked the part in his photos and his younger brother was my age. So I thought... He was extremely attractive in his photos and even proved it was him in his pictures by holding items I asked for. He started paying my WoW subscription which in the long run I realized it was to get my home address and real name. I was so stupid and heartbroken over my brother's friend, years of teaching myself online safety and the ability to be strong against flirting was all but lost in the fog. We'd talk for hours on Ventrilo, and he'd make me feel pretty. I was completely blinded by this point. He sent me gifts and I didn't even question how he had my address. Then he offered to drive and pick me up, as only then did I suddenly get cold feet. I had a good friend on WoW, someone my brother met at PAX and joined the guild and is still one of my best friends to this day, though we both aren't fond of my older brother. He's six years older than me but never creeped on me, was more like the protective brother I lacked. Well at least till I was 24 and single for the first time did we hook up lol but that's because we were friends for so long but the distance led to it not turning into a relationship, he caught onto it through conversation and was my words of wisdom in a time I was lacking any of my own. He saw something was fishy when I couldn't. I told my friend I was scared to meet him because 
dumb teenager logic, I thought he would not like me. My friend chimed in that I shouldn't meet anyone off the internet at my age. I told him about the gifts and I swear I've never been scolded like this in my life, not even by my own parents, but he always cared like that. He wondered why I would give my address to someone I never met, and the expensive gifts I got were not something the average 19-year-old could afford. None of this ever clicked for me of course because I was lonely and trying to prove it to myself, my crush or something I could get a boyfriend. Like that I told the guy it wasn't wise to meet in person and my parents said I wasn't allowed to. That's when it went dark. At first it was pestering over and over, guilting me over gifts he gave me and encouraging me to defy my parents. While he kept bothering me, it never once occurred to me he'd lose his mind. While my friend was worried crapless about the guy having my address, going as far to drive the 11 hours to my house and explain the situation to my dad as I refused to tell him out of fear of getting in trouble at the time, all while taking his spring break in my state instead of his own with his friends. There's a reason he's still one of my best friends. He has a little sister of his own as well and she's my age so his protective nature is natural. Eventually he made me block the guy and that was that, this guy was pissed off. He'd go on different accounts to accuse me of gold digging and using him. Luckily my friend was smart enough and had the foresight to change my WA password and even paid for my account for me taking this guy off it entirely as one of this guy's threats was to delete my account. But it didn't end there, it got worse as he'd consistently find ways to message me and tell me how horrible I was. About a month had passed. I was walking home from school, about a two mile walk in wealthy suburbs of New England, which I had done for years. Many kids did as it was a very safe town with no crime in it or surrounding towns. Without a second thought I took off with my 100 pounds backpack, maybe an overestimate lol, put my headphones in and started my 20 minute walk home. It was cold so I had earmuffs over my headphones only drowning out sound more too. I swear if I could talk to myself as a kid I would probably just slap myself for stupidity. Because while guy, knew I walked home every day as I talked about it. He knew my address and I never thought twice. I was on the back roads walking home and honestly it was easy to map from my school to home as it was pretty straightforward with only one turn. At halfway home between songs I heard a vague crunching sound of tires rolling over gravel on the road slowly. I turned around to see a tinted black car that you couldn't see much of the person in front. I jogged out of the driveway I was standing in front of assuming it was waiting to turn in. But I didn't turn in, the roads were dead and it didn't make sense for him not to go around. I swear the saying that you go cold when you're terrified is absolutely true. It could have been a summer's day at 95 degrees and my bones would have been cold. My heart just sank and my breathing was uncontrollable. I felt like I had no control over my body as I realized this guy was following me. My blood truly ran cold and my hands shook as tears formed and my skin felt tight. My body felt like it wasn't ready to fight or flight but simply freeze there and die. It only got worse as the second time I turned my head to see the car stop. I stopped, my world stopped. I couldn't stop staring, just froze and breathing like all my school books were on my chest. Crying silently, my eyes hurt with no tears or sound as I just stood there. The door opened after what felt like hours but only seconds, maybe a minute. And it was in fact him, it was the attractive guy from the photos, not a catfish but something seemed different. At first I thought it was his angry expression but soon realized, he was definitely not 19, more like 30 plus. I could barely think over the loud sound of my heart racing as it froze me in place. I thought I was about to throw up as he spoke to me, told me to get in the car or he'd light my house on fire and kill my dog in front of me. I honestly just couldn't move, couldn't reach for my phone as his words just froze me. And like some magic we both failed to notice the little old lady on her porch watching this play out. Suddenly I hear her yell, get away from that girl right now before I burn you alive. We both turn to meet her eyes pissed off a small lady about 60 or 70 with white hair. I think she noticed my frozen state of fear as she told me to get over to her quickly. Like that I ran over to her tossing off my heavy brick of a backpack. It was obvious he was unsure what to do next as he stood there and watched me run to her. Must have been a sight of this tiny thin old lady standing in front of a teenage girl yelling at this man to go away. Like that savior number two joined the battle as her husband stepped out. A guy who looked like he'd been through a war or two the shotgun of all things and booming voice. Gun pointed saying, I've shot and killed men for less reason, you better leave now. He got into his car and drove off as I simply collapsed, all that fear just came out as I cried harder and harder as my brain sifted through the past few months of mistakes. 
after calming me down enough to speak in non-hyperventilating words, she asked me if I knew him. I told her kind of, but only online from a video game, not real life. Of course explaining it wasn't easy, and her husband couldn't grasp why I'd want to print it I was at war, I'm sure in his experience he was thinking Call of Duty, not magical creatures in a game called World of Warcraft. She got on the phone with the school counselor, her daughter apparently and told her my name. I was well known to her daughter ironically, but it was only 250 or less kids in the school and the town itself was small. Many staff at our school had family in town, kids at school they were related to either by their own children or their siblings' children. It was the kind of town if you didn't leave by a certain age you were stuck there. So honestly it seems ironic but entirely not a huge surprise. The counselor was well aware of my family and my mom's drug addiction as child services had been involved a few times. She came by in 10 minutes to pick me up and asked me a ton of questions of course knowing I didn't want to involve the police as I was scared of being taken away from my parents again. FYI foster care was worse than a drugged out mom on prescriptions. We weren't rich but we were more well off than many. Though my mom worked, my dad kept my mom on a tight budget to keep her from buying prescriptions from Canada. She wasn't prescribed, hence her trying to take my money. She knew all of this and knew though rough I was better off than foster care which was a gamble with losing odds at best. Plus two more years and I'd be off to college anyway. So we didn't involve the cops, but she made me promise to take the bus every day and to inform my dad of the situation. She also called my dad at work to inform him and had a teacher make sure I got on the bus every day till I graduated even. Really sucked but I understood. If it ended there it would be nice but there's still a bit more and I'm sorry for the length and grammar. It's late at night and I recall from memory and typing on my phone. Two days after this, my dad had to fly out for business. My brother was off at college so it left me and my high mom, who promised my dad she stay sober while he was gone but I was used to helping her while she was high, it was like taking care of a child. But I was on edge as ever in that big house from the 60s, cats stirred at night, and dogs barking outside set me on edge. I barely slept. My friend from what called every night making sure I was okay for the past month. I lived in the middle of the woods, next to a huge river in my backyard so there was still a lot of wildlife outside in the dead silence of cold months. Running water is an important source of water when lakes freeze. I had been used to all the bumps in the night, cats coming and going and dogs barking at every animal in the yard, but it all seemed new to me as I laid in bed trying to drown out my fears. The house I grew up in was a six-bedroom house. I had a little sister too but she stayed with my grandma in another state per court order while I was allowed to choose due to her only being 9 and me 16. The other rooms were used as a game room, office for my dad and guest room mostly for when my sister visited my grandma and she had a room. So in a large house like that in the middle of the woods, it was scary to virtually be alone because my mom accounted for defenseless. I was letting my last cat inside for the night five cats who all knew to come in at night for dinner and stayed until morning. And at the end of the long driveway between my neighbor and our house was parked a black car. I quickly shut the door and locked it after my cat got inside. I made sure all five doors were locked and even put cardboard on the glass doors to the pool lick hoping if he broke them it would delay him if that car was his. I went and turned off all the lights and got all my cats into one room so I knew they were safe. Here's the thing about my dog. He's untrained for the most part but was basically a giant lab puppy in his mind. But he growled at strangers, not barked like at animals. We had to keep him outside if we had guests but he never bit anyone and if you spend enough time around him he'd eventually accept you. Also he didn't growl at all strangers either so he wasn't the most reliable guard dog either. But he was big, and deep bark. I mauled over what to do as I sat there in the dark with my dog, waiting for Shadow to pass by the window. I eventually went upstairs to my mom's room and woke her up from her sleeping pill slumber. Groggy and still kinda high she didn't quite grasp what I was telling her till I started crying. She sorta sobered up and asked me to get her some coffee and I did. All while I'm watching my dog's every move because I know he could sense something before I did. As my mom sobered, her fear in her eyes grew. Eventually she got the idea to call my neighbors and ask them if they knew the car. After all said no two of the men went out of their house to check the car together. The car was empty. At closer inspection though, they noticed it was a newer car, Lexus, and in the passenger seat was a laptop. The car was locked but with the flashlight you could see somewhat into the tinted windows. They never told us why but something they saw in the car prompted them to call the local sheriff, only one and he lived in town sort of thing. 
we were too small to have a police department. He drove over about 15 minutes later, ran the plates and asked the houses around about it. Apparently it was a rental car from Ohio, and he was calling to see who it was rented to but the offices were closed I think. He stuck around in his car for about an hour till someone came out of the woods and ran back in as the cop turned his spotlight on him. I couldn't see what he was pointing at with his light as it was at the side of my house and I was looking at the front. I guess he called for backup as three other cop cars showed up in five minutes of it from the neighboring town slash highway patrol inc. At which a lady cop got out as I asked to speak with her and she called my counselor at school to explain who that might be. I was pretty shy back then but it's something about a female cop made me feel more comfortable to open up to. I told her the gist of the story, then she called my counselor who backed up my story but also explaining why I was scared of cops cause my history with foster care and not wanting to go back. At which a mostly sober mom joined me hugging me, doing her typical apologetic routine, but also offering much needed comfort as she called my dad too. Eventually the lady cop asked if she could take a look around the house to see if things were secure and get any information from my laptop about him. In her search she found something I didn't think about checking, the basement door was not just unlocked but open. It's never unlocked so I didn't even think to check it as our backyard floods in the spring due to beaver dams and it's got extra seals and stuff to prevent the basement from flooding. Again, but the stuff sealing it which was mostly sandbags and stuff were set aside. But the door at the bottom of the stairs was still locked though it had some damage like someone tried picking it. But he had access to half the basement that was storage, basement was sectioned and the other half used to be used for my brother's parties. The door between the sections was like a front door not an indoor door. As in the summer my dad left the hatch open to dry out the basement and adjust pool settings as it was basically the pool house and the cats loved it so it also had a few kept beds. The section that led upstairs was locked from the inside and the wall and door were not drywall and cheap door but lock and key heavy door and wall was brick. Upon noticing this my dad confirmed he had not left it open, my suspicions that black car was his was pretty much confirmed. As we walked through the house to make sure everything was still safe. She got on my laptop as they searched the woods, I gave her everything I had, his photos, username and she even checked to see if his credit card was still on my account but it wasn't. But the last few digits were. She then asked to take my laptop for a few days as she thought she could get some good evidence from it. I asked her to please not damage it and return it as soon as possible because I used it a lot, before smartphones it was all I had. After a few hours and onlooking neighbors had gone to bed the cops came back empty handed but left a cop outside our house and towed the guy's car. From what the lady cop told me, what permitted such fear was that in the car there were two guns, some sort of rope and handcuffs. And the guy who ran back into the dense woods was wearing a winter ski mask, not out of season but suspicious nonetheless. So eventually I tried to lay down and go to sleep but I was pretty sure I was going to call out sick tomorrow and kept all my cats inside for the day. I was too restless to sleep, every sound made me so scared. My mom slept with the dog in her room, I'm very allergic to animals but less to cats as I kinda built up a tolerance to cats but not dogs, and my cats slept in my room most nights by choice as my room was usually the warmest. At 3.30am I heard a knock at the back door, and a guy, an undercover police officer, opened up. I was still awake as I walked downstairs to make out a guy standing in the dark with a gun. As he saw me he demanded I let him in now as he needed to speak with me. Something felt off, my gut knew it before I did that this guy's voice seemed forced. Like someone purposely making their voice deeper. And why was he at the back door? So I turned on a light outside and sure enough, it was him. I just screamed as quickly as I screamed. He started hitting the door hard. Wasn't a very loud horror movie scream but more like a gasp scream. I don't think the fear in my body had a loud scream to let out. But the banging was pretty loud as I ran to the front to see if the officer was still outside. He was but he wasn't getting out of his car. I didn't want to run outside as I'm not a fast runner so I turned the porch lights on and off a couple times but still nothing. After a minute my dog came bolting down to the door barking and growling, nearly foaming at the mouth. Soon followed by my mom who yelled she had a gun, she didn't but bluff is bluff. Somehow during all this the cop outside had snuck around back and had his gun pointed at him yelling to put his gun down. I hit as the rest went down but he was arrested, no trial needed me to attend and my statement was enough. Come to find out he wasn't even American, the car was rented under his friend's name, and after all was done he was deported back to Canada. I assumed something with his passport would prevent him from coming back to the USA as the cop reassured me he couldn't come back to the USA now. 
it what exactly he was charged with but I think my dad said activated assault with a deadly weapon, attempted kidnapping and something else. And it also turned out he was 32 years old not 19 so I assume he being a minor carried a charge. And life moved on from there. I had plenty of creeps before and after but he was by the worst from wow. I had a couple from streaming but I was an adult and much better at staying safe online. Only one worse than this guy was my ex-boyfriend's cousin who made my life hell for a couple years but that's another story for another time. I've never posted one of these before but recently my friend brought up this story that I basically repressed and I figured people on here would be interested. I'm also using the names from the sweet life of Zach and Cody. It's 3am so my brain can't come up with actual names. Before I begin, I will clarify right now that I absolutely never led this kid on. Everyone who knew about it while it was happening will say the same. I'm not a flirty person and I was very careful not to say or do anything to make this boy believe I was into him. So we are traveling back 7 years, all the way back to when I was 14 years old. Makes me feel old as heck. I was at a high school sport event. It was a Friday night game. I can't remember if it was a football or baseball game. All I knew was it was the last day of school before spring break. I wasn't super into school spirit. I was an emo kid and a loner for the most part, but my best friend pressured me into going. I reluctantly agreed and looking back, I wish I didn't. I've known her since I was like four so if anyone can convince my stubborn ass to do something it's 100% her ha. For the sake of anonymity, we'll call stalker boy Zach and my guy friend Cody. I had met Zach through my friend Cody. I probably spoke to him for three minutes honestly. It was more like an introduction and I didn't vibe with the way he stared at me so I went back to all my girlfriends and we continued the night. After I got home, I received a text from Cody saying Zach thought I was pretty and wanted my phone number so he gave it to him. I didn't really think much about it. I mean it's not that I wanted him to have my number but I was super close with Cody and he was reliable so he would never give my number to someone if he thought something was off with them. So I wake up the next day, on a Saturday, and everything's fine. Towards the afternoon, I received a text saying, hey it's Zach, I got your number from Cody, so we had small talk basically. I didn't want to be a jerk, so I'd respond, mainly because he was friends with Cody so I didn't want to be rude. After about 45 minutes of texting, he tells me he's leaving for a cruise and was really upset I wasn't coming with. So obviously I asked what he meant and he said he would miss me and hated to be away from me for a week. I definitely thought it was extremely weird but I figured it was sarcasm or a joke so I texted back saying something like lol we've spoken for less than an hour, I think you'll be just fine, and he was like yeah I guess. From my perspective I had a lot going on in my life, I was very anxious talking to people, I suffered from depression and daddy issues. I wasn't someone who could just be like, your weird, block number. I was very shy and just didn't know what to do in the situation, so I will admit I let it go longer than I should have, but I was 14 and didn't realize who I was dealing with to be honest. He's on the cruise so I didn't hear from him for a week. Then eventually he gets off the boat and tells me I'm the first person he wanted to text. He even said he couldn't stop thinking about me and all the fun things we could have been doing while on the trip. The rest is pretty fuzzy. But all I really remember is Zach kept saying weird stuff like how we will get married in the future and how we are soulmates. How he's never been so I love with anyone. He became obsessed with me for some reason. If I didn't respond, he would text me every 5 minutes on the dot asking if I was mad at him until I responded. It was just very obsessive behavior. I would tell him I'm busy and he'd get upset. He just needed me to text him constantly. One day, I basically told him that he was taking things too far and I was uncomfortable. I said I was sorry if I had somehow led him on, but I think of him more as a friend. He definitely didn't like that response. He was making fake Instagrams to harass me, telling me he's going to kill himself because I broke his heart. Calling me a whore, my first kiss was at 18 and my first boyfriend at 19 so you do the math on whether I'm a whore or not LMFAO. He was just saying anything and everything to hurt me. I spent 6 hours apologizing while he was telling me I'm a horrible person and should kill myself. It was just a fucked up conversation. I could not get Zach to leave me alone. For months. After that, my friends had to sneak me around campus to avoid Zach. I'd have to cut through buildings and take the long way to steer clear from him. Eventually, after a few months, he stopped harassing me online and I actually thought I was free. Now flash forward to sophomore year. After months of being in a chemistry class I noticed my friend, we'll call him Max, 
had the same last name as Zach. It's an uncommon last name so it was like a little light bulb turned on in my brain and I immediately asked if they were related, and he rolled his eyes and said, yeah. I was like holy crap. We ended up chatting and apparently I'm not the only girl Zach would harass. Max told me he got sent to another school and was put into therapy for basically being crazy and aggressive. Zach unfortunately was extremely abusive towards Maximum. I was relieved he was sent away, Max was definitely more relieved he was sent away. It just made sense why the harassment stopped so suddenly. Now we're entering junior year, Max had informed me his brother was enrolled back at our high school. Thankfully I had a heads up, but nothing would prepare me when I actually saw him face to face. I walk into my English class and guess who's sitting in my god darn classroom? If you guessed Zach, you get a big ass gold star. The second we made eye contact he smiled the creepiest smile I have ever seen. I was so scared I almost crapped my own spleen out. Thankfully he never spoke to me or harassed me. However, he did spend every class staring at me with that scary grin on his face. As much as I wish I was making this up, unfortunately these are true events that really affected me in high school. When my friend brought it up the other day, it honestly felt like a fever dream. Like I just forgot it was all real. It was hard spending two whole years of high school terrified of bumping into him not knowing what he would do, especially after finding out everything his brother, Max, went through. But now it's been years since I've had to deal with him so Zach, let's never fucking meet again dude. Hope you've gotten the help you need.